19. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the fruit of the land. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. God has prepared plenty for all his children. But he doesn't go to force it on anybody. It is there for you to take by being obedient to him. So obedience is the secret that makes a difference in our lives with respect to our knowing and enjoying God. God does not reveal himself to disobedient people. And God does not bless disobedience for any reason. Disobedience is the cause of man's greatest tragedy in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that God planted a garden and filled it with all kinds of trees that produced all kinds of beautiful fruits. He put one tree there at the center of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree. If you eat it, you will die. The devil deceived them. They ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they died. And that singular disobedience robbed human beings, including you and me, of glory of God. And so Paul wrote to the Romans and said, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We weren't created the way we are now. We suffered defamation. We became deformed when our forefathers sinned through the act of disobedience. Right from that time till forever, God does not like disobedience. God hates it. Everything we call sin boils down to the act of disobedience. There is nothing that can be regarded as sin if at its basic if his basic element is not disobedience. So disobedience destroyed or attempted to destroy the glory of God in man. Jesus Christ was sent to restore us back to that glory we lost. So the book of Hebrews tells us that, that God desiring to bring many sons and many daughters Unto glory, allowed the captain of our salvation to suffer. Jesus suffered to bring us back to our glory. Now, just as the obedience of Adam robbed us of glory, the, just as the disobedience of Adam robbed us of glory, the obedience of Jesus restored to us everything we lost in Adam and much more. Romans chapter 5, verse 19, made that point very clear. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The obedience of Jesus nullified the disobedience of Adam, and the obedience of Jesus brought us back to the glory with which God created us. And the only way we can remain in that glory and enjoy that glory is to live a life of dedicated obedience to God. This obedience is not necessarily the obedience of do's and don'ts. This obedience is the ability of a believer to hear the voice of God and to obey him. Anytime God tells you to do anything and you hear him, and you obey him, you reap blessings. We don't have time to share testimonies to validate that truth. This ministry is what it is today because somebody had the voice of God and obeyed. You will become what God wants you to be simply by hearing his voice 
and obeying him. Every act of obedience unleashes the glory of God in the believer. Therefore, obedience is the princess of all virtues. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have. If you live a life of disobedience, everything you have will become nothing as far as God is concerned. But if you live a life of obedience, even what you don't have will become yours because God will make sure that the obedient is blessed. If you read through your Bible clearly, you will discover that the best blessings of God are always given to people who obey him, including the Holy Spirit. It tells us that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey God. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. The glory of God answers to nothing but human obedience. You don't attract God's glory without obedience. If you pray in disobedience, God will not answer your prayers. If you fast in disobedience, God will not, answer your, will not bless your fasting. If you give offerings and give alms to support the work of the ministry in disobedience, well, the ministry will collect your money, but they won't benefit you at all. We must learn to obey God. And when you have a habit of hearing the voice of God and obeying him as a matter of habit, you are setting yourself up for perpetual blessings. Because the glory of God answers to nothing but to human obedience. Let's learn to obey God. Let's learn to listen to the voice of God and to hear him. We have developed a, a spiritual culture that does not respect the voice of God. We come into a place of prayer. We tell God everything we want to tell him and dump our wish list on him and turn our back and run away. But the Bible tells me that in the, when you come to prayer, what God tells you is more important than what you tell God. I'm not sure you get that, but it's, it's very important. You have not prayed until you had God. What God tells you in prayer is more important than what you tell him. The reason is simple. God doesn't need you to tell him anything because he knows everything. And he has the answer to everything. So our interest would be to listen to hear his voice. That's what the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 in verse 1 and 2. We must be more prepared to hear God than to say things in his presence. Obedience is the only way you can prove your love for God. If I ask us in this hall now, how many of us love God with all our heart? Virtually everybody will raise their hands to heaven. But God says very clearly in the Bible that people who love him are only those people who obey him. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. John chapter 14 verse 21 says, He who has my commandment and keeps them is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 23 says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Anyone who loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The way to love God is to obey him. You cannot say you love anybody. You love your parents when you don't obey them. Obedience is the key to intimacy. Everything boils down to intimacy. Who is God? Apostle Paul spoke of people who worship an unknown God. A lot of times it seems to me that Christians worship a God they haven't met. A God they only read in literature. A God somebody tells them about. They have not had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. They don't know how God feels. They don't know what God likes. They don't know how the voice of God sounds. And because of that, they don't live a life of obedience. The reason is simple. You have not intentionally cultivated obedience. John chapter 14 verse 21 says, and of course, if you have your Amplified Bible and you read this passage in Amplified Bible, it's awesome. John chapter 14 verse 21, 
he who has my commandment and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And we will love him and manifest myself to him. He will reveal himself. He will show himself. He will come to you and live in your place. Obedience attracts God far more than anything anybody can do and anybody can say. Because obedience is a demonstration of our love for God and the way, the only way, actually, we can develop intimacy with him. Intimacy with God is the reason we are created. That was why Adam was created. And so in the cool of the day, God will go down to the Garden of Eden to have fellowship with Adam and Eve. And when they disobeyed God, they ran from God's presence. God does not pursue anybody. It's human beings that run away from God. When you disobey God, something tells you to run. But God keeps pursuing you to bring you back to where he wants you to be. Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 7 said that God created us and gave us a heart to know him. So there is a desire or there ought to be a desire in your heart to want to know God. And I can see that desire everywhere because that's why you gather. And if you really desire to know God, then you must crave for intimacy. Get, to, get closer to him as close as possible. It is in the place of intimacy that you encounter the glory of God and you manifest the power and the authority that God will have you to manifest on earth. This is very, very important. Very, very important. If you realize in the, if you read the scriptures closely, you will see that there is what I call intimacy continuum. God has graduated, graded our relationship with him depending on our level of intimacy with him. I will quickly mention that and then we will close so we can go. We find that in the book of John in chapter 15, in verse 13, to verse 16, this is what the Bible says. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friend if you do whatever I command you to do. No longer do I call your servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you. That you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit shall abide. Should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, the Father will give it to you. In the intimacy continuum, we all began with Jesus as our Savior. Everybody who must know God must accept Jesus as his Savior. And without that, there is no way, there can't be any relationship between you and God. You must be born again. That is where everybody starts. But many a time, we remain at that level. And all we do the rest of our life is to sin and make confession. And plead the blood of Jesus. Just to remember, just to keep there. Because God wants us to grow. When Jesus becomes your savior, he expects you to make him your, your Lord, your master. And that happens through the process of discipleship. You came to a place where you can now obey him at all times. You are no longer living for yourself, you are living for him. I live for Jesus day after day. The Holy Spirit, I will obey. I live for Jesus day after day. I know chorus we used to sing in those many, many in those days. That's, that's the, the song of a disciple. You have come to know the master and you are living for him. And you are living in obedience to him. Jesus becomes your Lord. But at that, it's a master-servant relationship. There is an element of fear involved in that relationship. That was where the apostles were in Matthew, in John chapter 15. And Jesus says something very, very powerful to them. He said, I no longer call you servants. For servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. 
For everything I had from my father, I have made known to you. You graduate from Jesus just being merely your Lord and your Savior to become your friend. You are growing in intimacy. And Jesus will begin to confide in you. He begin to tell you things about people. He begin to tell you things about individuals. And he begin to send you on special errands. He begin to discuss programs with you. The Bible says God can't do anything until he discusses that with his prophets. When God was going to the Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, how can I do this without telling it to Abraham? He went back and spoke to Abraham because Abraham was God's friend. Here Jesus called the apostles, you are now my friends because everything that my father tells me, I have passed along to you. I'm sure you would like to do that. It's the best way to live. It's a beautiful way to live. Becoming friends of God is the goal of everybody. And the secret is in obedience. The more you obey God, the more you, you, God will come to trust you. And when God knows that I can rely on this fellow, I can trust him, he brings you to a place where you can be his friend. He will reveal secrets to you. It's so sweet and it's so interesting. Several people have, no, 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 number of occasions. God has spoken to me about issues. Somebody will sit in my office and be telling me stories. But God will tell me what the situation is. I tell the young man, why are you telling me lies now? This is what happened. And the good time, they start crying. Why are you crying? You think God will let me know? Somebody did something in particular, and I was in my office nowhere. And I picked my call and I called. I said, what have you just done? He said, what? And I told her, say, how do you know? I said, how wouldn't I know? How wouldn't I know? Now you get to a level where God confides in you and tells you things. But that's not even the best. The best is found in the book of Revelations. You can graduate from just being mere friends with God to become his bride. Jesus becomes our bridegroom. From Savior, when you respond to the gospel, to Lordship, when you surrender to him as your Lord, to your friend, where you can communicate with him easily, and he trusts you, and then until he becomes your bridegroom. Well, of course, many of you were young yesterday. I mean, you can see how many of you are getting married now. I asked them the relationship between them before they got married. There is a whole lot of intimacy involved in it. And a whole lot, because whatever belongs to the groom belongs to the bride. There is no separation any longer. That is where God wants us to get to. We can actually get there now before we get to the marriage feast of the Lamb. But the secret is obedience. God cannot take you from where you are to where he wants you to get to until you dedicate yourself to obeying his voice. Obedience makes a whole lot of difference. One of the days I was coming to the U.S. and I was flying. No, I was in the U.S. actually. I was in, I was in Los Angeles. I was going to preach in a church in Philadelphia. And I was flying U.S. airline, and the plane spoiled in the heavens, in the air. Uh, it was a bad experience that I don't expect anybody to experience before. And people were crying. I didn't know white men can also cry in danger. Everybody was screaming and shouting and crying. I was afraid myself. And I closed my eyes to pray. And I saw the face of my first son. I said, God, I haven't finished training this young man, and I want to do it by myself. And the Holy Spirit says something that changed my life. He said, I know you are here. Come on. So I became like St. Paul. I got up and I said, everybody be quiet. The master whom I serve just spoke to me. He says, he knows I'm here. We will land somewhere. And we will land somewhere in New Mexico. I think they call it, is it Abakuku or Agakuku, whatever. At the middle of the night. That is how God wants to relate with us. It's available to every believer. The secret is obedience. I would like you to close your eyes now and pray. Make a prayer of dedication. Go out of this conference with a new level of commitment to obey the voice of God. The Bible says that Jesus became everything he becomes today because he obeyed God, even to the death, obedience to the death on the cross. And because he obeyed God to that level, God elevated him and giving him a name above every name. That at the mention of that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And the Bible says that Jesus came giving us an example that we should follow in his steps. The secret is obedience. Read the Bible closely. God, you can go to anywhere with God. God can take you to any level of relationship. God can even take you to see heaven, even now. 
as you live on this earth. God can give you revelations of his glory if only you will cultivate a life of obedience. Heavenly Father, rebellion is not good. In fact, you likened rebellion and disobedience to be equivalent to the sin of witchcraft. You want us to obey you. You want us to be driven by your voice and not by our needs. You want us to act because we are hearing you ask us to do something rather than that we are being pushed around by circumstances of our lives. I lift up every single one of us in church this morning and present us before you. And I ask you, oh God, activate our ears that we can hear you. Activate the eyes of our spirit that we may see visions of what you are doing in heaven. And help us to live a life of dedicated obedience to you. That was how Jesus lived. Jesus said, I do not do anything by my own power. What I see the Father do, that is what I do. What I hear the Father say, that is what I do. Lord, that's going to be our lifestyle beginning from today. Thank you as you bless us and help us by your spirit to learn to obey your voice at all times in Jesus' name. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we really don't have time. I, I, don't, um, I grew up under the pulpit of Pastor Cosmos, literally. I got born again listening to him. And I am blessed to have him as a father following me, blessing me, and praying for me. He came from Nigeria just for this. And I have been, when I have been talking to him about, I say, you are, you are going to speak for 15 minutes. He said 10 minutes is enough. And I wonder how a man of God, I'm talking about a man that runs up to 500 churches all over the world, will come here and talk for 10 minutes. Many people will tell me, if I cannot pay for first class, if I can't do this, they are not coming. But he comes on his own. He doesn't even ask me for money to show up here. And then he speaks. And the value of it I want you to get is that you must have a father. You know, I introduced another, uh, my, uh, uh, somebody yesterday as my father in the Lord. There are, the origin of me comes from this dad. What you see me doing is under the man that you saw yesterday. So I have two fathers that I am faithful to. And this man, I don't play with him. Don't mess with him. Amen? I'm saying this for you to find a father. You must have a spiritual word. Don't be your own covering. You need somebody that you look up onto, that you tell that is praying for you and following you and making sure that you are standing where you're supposed to stand. That's something I want BCF to know. And that's why I'm excited that you come, sir. I love you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, too, sir. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we are closing right now. Um, um, I feel like not releasing us. I, I, I love the fellowship so much.